can't believe what happened. I thought I was a goner for sure. Dead as a fish in a soup. But it looks like little Rix and I are just fine. We're not only lucky that the Royal Grace was built so well, but that we have such a kind group of people to take care of us. You know, Captain Alex and their crew has just been the most delightful bunch of scallywags I've ever had the pleasure of being around. And that's saying something from someone who spent most of their lives with beasties and thieves. I really do hope that one day I could call this place home. If I'm lucky, that is. I think a lot of me wants to stay with this group, even after we help Edgar. They all just seem so close. But enough of my daydreams. So much has happened. Well, sort of. We've arrived in a new city, but Hattie seems to be filled to the brim with the jitters that the darlings will be on our tail soon. Poor thing. I assume that it has to do with whatever she saw in their basement, since she flew out of there like no one's business. Not that I blame her. I would have done the same thing had I been more squeamish. Not that what the darlings did was a light affair, but... Oh... You get what I'm saying. I told you all of this before. The city we're currently in is called Morella. It's beautiful here too, but nothing like Divine Fox. I realize that that's probably because the darlings chose to roost there, but still. Morella is a good place to hide, according to Alex, because there are very few people inhabiting the city. It's more of a seaside town, if you will. The locals are very nice, most of them in fishing businesses. But what really surprised me about this place was that they all knew the captain. I guess they've done good deeds for the town before. All the people praise the crew wherever they may tread. I even got a discount on some frozen cat toys for Ricks. Oops. Careful, little babe. You don't want to lose your tongue. My apologies. Ricks isn't used to the frozen kind. I've taken our time on Morella to look into new engineering parts. I have little money, but Hattie offered me some of her own. I asked her why, and she smiled in a strange manner, mind you. And she said to me, not to worry about it. She just said it was a gift amongst friends. And then, when she saw Angelics on my back, she giggled and said that it was also because I had reminded her of her guardian angel. I shrugged and told her that just because I created wings called Angelics doesn't mean that I, myself, am anything near the grace of an angel. She gave an awkward laugh and adjusted those large, bug-like goggles of hers on her eyes and just said that wasn't why. Before I could ask, she walked away. I've been pondering over that exchange. Hattie is always so happy and excited, so full of life, but she seems so... Nervous, I suppose is the word. I'm worried about her. Um, audio diary, it appears I will have to consult with you later. Something seems to be going on up above. I will report back as soon as I can. Oh, audio diary. I think the chickens have come home to roost. Well, that's not really the most appropriate phrase for what we've all just witnessed, but... There's nothing that could really describe this odd situation. Edgar came back from what I thought was a stroll about the city, but instead he had another man with him. This lad was the same height as Edgar, the same color scheme, the same, well, everything. The difference was, well, sort of comical in a way. This boy wore glasses while Edgar did not. Edgar was dragging the other boy onto the ship, a ray gun at the ready should the lad try and make an escape. Now Edgar is handsome and all, but I never thought of him as a type to do such a thing. Holding someone at gunpoint was just not something I would have ever foreseen such as, well, sweet boy is the kinder term to use, doing. But all of us were just in shock at the extremely close similarity that we all just sort of well, ignored the immediate danger. We sort of just gawked. The lad wailed for someone to help him and I heard Hattie giggle behind me. <laughs> you know, um, this new lad sounds nothing like Edgar. Edgar has such an appeasing voice, but this poor boy, well, <laughs> high and squeaky like a little mouse he is. Um, <laughs> Anyways, 
Edgar was hysterical. I managed to calm him down, but I'm sure he felt as if he were going crazy. I'm sure at that point we all thought we were going crazy. The lad tried to run away, but Lewis, ugh, Lewis, stopped the boy. He said that we were all just a little too curious to let him go. And when he said it, he had on that disgusting weasel smile of his. Oh, how I despise that man. Not that he's done anything to earn my distaste, but, well, if you met him, you'd understand. Alex then approached the newcomer and asked what their name was. He said his name was Ernest. When Alex asked for a last name, he muttered, Cadwell. Audio diary, do you remember when I spoke of Mr. Cadwell's fate? When he said that there were other heirs, not just Edgar? Well, I think he was referring to this. That there were other children like Ernest on other planets. Legitimate heirs that could take over should anything happen to the Cadwells on Flora. Edgar asked who Ernest's mother was. Ernest replied he had no mother. He was genetically engineered by his father. That he hadn't seen his father in about a year. He asked if we knew of him. Ernest is handsome and all, <laughs> much like his brother. But audio diary, if ever I've seen an innocent, it is definitely this boy. He has no idea what sort of heir he is. What the last name he bears even means. Ernest states that he was raised in a small home off by the shore. Just a two-story house made of sea-soaked wood and painted in various shades of white and blue. One that he rarely left the comfort of. He was raised by a maid, handpicked by his father. Her name was Alistronia. She's an intimidating woman, he claimed, and his face reddened when he admitted he'd gained none of her strength. Oh, audio diary. Ernest was just a shaking little leaf. This boy, well, I don't think Mr. Cadwell could leave such a boy in charge. I have a feeling that he, well, wasn't exactly made right, so to speak. I've since discussed this thought with Edgar and he silently agreed. If Ernest were to be a real heir to Trav Towers and the Cadwell wealth, well, then, wouldn't he at the very least know about it? Edgar explained that from birth he'd been groomed so that in any instance, if something were to happen to his father, he would be able to take over. Of course, no one would have suspected that day would come so soon, and that it would be at the hands of other aristocrats. Well, everyone except Mr. Cadwell, it seems. He was well prepared for all of this, just like he said right before Julian Locklove. No, I really don't want to relive that. The closer I get to Edgar as a friend, the more dreadful that scene becomes. To see someone you care about lose their family. I found myself praying to the old gods for them, right alongside my grandfather. Alex declared that Ernest should stay with us until we sort out the situation. Although, the way they said it, it seemed so forceful. So I went over and asked the boy if he wanted to set sail with us. I told him how nice everyone was and how we'd be okay. And I told him that, quite frankly, we needed him, that Edgar needed him. He asked why I gave him what was probably the funniest of looks. Did this boy not see the resemblance, I thought. He's handsome and all, but clearly not the brightest cow in the herd. When I explained that Edgar was technically his brother, well, audio diary, I think it was the cutest expression I've ever seen on someone's face. Unlike Edgar, it appears that Ernest has wanted a brother ever since he was a strapping boy. His face lit up like a solar flare and he rushed into Edgar's embrace. Edgar, well, he looked like a cat in water, but the crew and I seemed to find it all that much more adorable. I told Edgar I would go with him to grab his things and tell his caretaker that he'd be leaving for a while. Edgar was planning on how to tell Ernest that well, their father was no more. I don't look forward to that conversation. Edgar may have seemed he did, well, more than he did really, but once he was alone with me, 
I saw him deeply consider what he was going to say to Ernest. I think that deep down, Edgar couldn't find it in himself to hate another human being, especially when he knows that they're brothers. Alex came in a few moments ago before Edgar left and asked what the plan was now. We hadn't told Alex about the other heirs. I think Edgar has been saving that for some reason. Like if Captain Stranwood were to, well, double cross us, I suppose. But nowadays, I don't think Alex would do that. We're friends, practically family in my eyes. But Alex had a strange look on their face. I will admit that. I'm sure it's just stressful when your crew begins to grow so rapidly. Not to mention it's yet another aristocrat, technically. They told Edgar he should be more worried about the heirs that do know of their life's purpose. The aristocrats may be targeting them if they know of their existence which Edgar and I both know to be the truth. I really hope his other siblings, however many there are, are okay. Edgar seems to be worried about it. He's handsome and all, and he really does have a kind heart. Oops, Ernest is knocking at my door. Nervous little numpty, isn't he? Well, I'll go take him to get his things. I wonder if he'd like to try a pair of angelics. I've been working on Edgar's, much to his dismay. I wonder if Ernest will be just as scared as Heights as his brother. Oh, I really have to go. Well, until next time. This episode of Bosch and Brave was written and produced by Ashley Glenn, voiced by Clover Grayson, and brought to you by Blackmore Productions. Like what we do here? Follow us on Facebook, Tumblr, YouTube, SoundCloud, and iTunes. Want to tell us how great we are? Send us a message at blackmailproductions at gmail.com. Also, we have a website. Go to blackmoreproductions.com to get the latest updates on your favorite podcasts. Until then, take flight to the skies, fellow Angelics pilots. We look forward to seeing you next month. Blackmore Productions. Swim against the current.